Uh, so we chose to put his dominant hand into the, his tummy and was a, he was able to uh, use his left hand for communicating. It's a great pleasure to come and talk uh, to all of you at the Alpine Club. Um, I'm going to talk to you about frostbite. In terms of my own background, I've written quite a few papers on uh, cold and altitude and a couple of books as well. We've, as uh, Dave explained, run the uh, BMC uh, telemedicine service uh, for over a decade. But far more relevant to this talk is the photographs that I took this morning of my digits. I feel that uh, I can demonstrate that I am able to look after myself so far in difficult circumstances. What am I going to talk about? What is frostbite? What's the sort of setting? How do you get it? Um, I'm going to focus on what you can do um, about uh, a developing frostbite on a route, then a little bit on secondary or hospital treatment and how to avoid it. So without further ado, let's get on with it. So what is frostbite? You can see uh, that in the picture there, um, a series of hands taken over a number, uh, well, two hands and fingers taken over 10 days. And you can see the, the way it's developed from some blistering on day one through to day seven, where you can see some tissue damage. What you've got is a reduced blood flow because of the peripheral vasoconstriction from cold. And this results in sludging of the microcirculation. It's often numb. Uh, and then this, because of the lack of flow to it, you start to get tissue death. And fr uh, frostbite is an irreversible freezing injury to the extremities. There is a slight caveat to that in that uh, there's now evidence that frostbite may at least be partially irreversible if treated within 24 to 48 hours. And we'll talk about that briefly. A couple more photographs. This is taken at about 24 hours, and this is the same chap um, 14 days later. And you can see the demarcation and the way in which those bits of tissue that haven't got an oxygen supply die. So how do you get it? Well, I first read about it um, as a teenager, reading about Annapurna and Morris Herzog's famous retreat from the summit. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with it. And he went on to... Uh, have a successful career as a politician, but his retreat from uh, Annapurna was really quite a ghastly occasion. A little bit of um, physics. It's based on the second law of thermodynamics. And very simply, if you put a, a cup of tea on the counter, it will get cold and it will not under any circumstances unless you put it in the microwave warm up. And that's essentially what's happening. Heat is flowing spontaneously from a higher temperature to a lower temperature region. And if we look at the ways in which you lose heat um, in the mountains or anywhere else, it's through these four different mechanisms, convection, evaporation, radiation, and conduction. And when you're sitting on that bivy, you need to start to think about how you might mitigate these losses. This is a infrared thermography photograph um, that was taken in fact recently in Norway. And you can see how the faces are uh, putting out a lot of heat. And interestingly, also the thighs and to a certain extent, the uh, feet. There are a number of risk factors for developing frostbite, the primary one being temperature, but also wind chill is very significant. And if you're wet, uh, you lose heat more quickly. Altitude something, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, but also equipment. There's quite a lot of very good equipment out there, but one of the problems is people don't necessarily use it very well. So first of all, you need to have it and then you need to use it appropriately. Nutrition and hydration can be problems. We heard on the last talk from Jeremy about hydration, but nutrition on particularly some of the bigger um, Himalayan routes, such as uh, the Bazino Ridge last week, becomes a really big issue. And the duration of exposure, and then some individuals seem to be more resistant to cold than others. This was a study done by our medical students at Warwick Medical School. Uh, they were, took a number of individuals and put them into a hypoxic chamber in Birmingham. Uh, and you can see here the perfusion of the hands appears to be pretty normal in Birmingham. And then as they pumped out the oxygen, gradually increasing the altitude to the summit of Tukval, which was where their expedition was, you can see how the periphery shut down. And this is as a result of breathing more quickly, blowing off carbon dioxide and vasoconstricting. And then on returning to uh, normal oxygen levels, the hands warm up. And the temperature didn't change in that chamber for the entire time. So you can see the effect of hypoxia on peripheral circulation quite graphically there. So let's get on to this bivy. Um, that what can you do about it? You've got a balance here between heat generation and heat loss. 
we've talked about the way in which you lose heat so you need to think about behavioral issues how you might mitigate the losses so you might have some shelter with you get inside a, a group shelter or into a tent you need to start thinking about whether you've got all your um, um, appropriate clothing on and if there's anything wet remove those if you're sitting in a harness is there any way you can get out of the harness because that will be restricting the flow to your legs you might be able to sit on the ropes to get yourself some insulation optimize your clothing and we've talked about the gloves and mitts think about external heat sources sometimes you can get warmth either from chemical uh, hand warmers or electrical ones uh, the other thing that you might think about um, is getting a brew on and we'll talk about in the metabolic and then finally descent that you need to get off that mountain if at all possible so that's the way in which you could reduce heat loss the other way of thinking about it is how you can generate heat and this would be um, taking in some hot sweet fluids get a brew on as I said eat some food uh, your body in order to generate heat needs um, a source of energy so if you if you are hungry and you haven't eaten for hours that's a problem you can generate heat by exercising at extreme altitude that's ex very difficult but at modest altitudes that might be reasonable if we go back to extreme altitude the other thing that you could do is take um, oxygen so you might if you've got a supply you might turn it up or if there's some available get hold of it so what else could, can you do secondary or uh, further treatment well, you need to try to gently warm up the areas uh, that are concerned um, ideally you're putting it into water baths at uh, roughly baby bath temperature so somewhere around 39 degrees centigrade simple non-adherent dressings and then using creams like aloe vera which is, has an anti-prostaglandin effect or ibuprofen and then if you've got breaks from the skin you need to think about tetanus toxide the big issue that really if I can get across to the audience is wait before any surgery there's a huge enthusiasm uh, of surgeons uh, and I speak as a surgeon uh, inexperienced surgeons who haven't seen one think it would be quite interesting to get on it's a young fit patient which they haven't seen for years and they offer an early amputation uh, and this can be catastrophic so wait you really shouldn't be thinking about doing anything for the first six to twelve weeks and I'm going to talk briefly about the um, British Mountaineering Council uh, frostbite service which we've now been running for 15 or so years so traditional surgical approach um, this is Tishi on descending from um, Chioyu you can see someone's very kindly offering him a cigarette to smoke this is not a good idea this is a South Korean climber who got into trouble at about 7500 meters and if you look at her uh, left hand you can see that there's demarcation occurring there that doesn't look too bad but if you look at the same hand some two months later you can see that there was a catastrophic injury there that would completely transform her life um, and how she might live so what else could, could be done as an alternative we've talked about the BMC internet frostbite service this is something that David Paul and I have been running for a, a, a while now and you can get uh, access to this it's free uh, and between us we will offer advice um, usually within 24 to 48 hours if you had serious frostbite and you can get to help within two to uh, 24 to 48 hours then you need to consider thrombolysis this is using the same drugs that would be used to treat an acute heart attack or an acute stroke to clear the clot and with that you can actually open up the vessels and this is a lady that actually was involved in a um, road traffic uh, breakdown in Minnesota got very cold there's no perfusion to the tips of her toes you can see the blood flowing on this angiogram but there's nothing here after 24 hours of thrombolysis you can see the end result is a well perfused foot uh, and she was able to we, it was possible to save her toes so this sort of treatment is now available but clearly you need to think about how you can get help it used to be that this was only available um, in uh, Europe and North America but now the CWEP clinic is offering this in uh, Kathmandu so again if you can get yourself down quickly we, the treatment can be started so prevention how do you avoid pr uh, uh, frostbite bite I've talked a bit about kit and as a surgeon using my hands to earn my living I'm particularly concerned with my fingers and this uh, is the sort of um, kit that I used um, both on Everest uh, and on Vincent and you can see here a range of gloves uh, getting onto mitts spare mitts hand warmers all the gloves have got hand sewn in um, idiot loops so I can't lose them fresh pair of socks so they're nice and clean electric heated um, 
inner, uh, inners and 8,000 meter boots. And that's just the, for the extremities. You then need to think about how you're going to keep the core warm. Also the kit you're going to use in terms of whether it's your tent, your stove and so on. And I'm not going to go into all of that, but you need to think very carefully about what you, you're going to do. The other thing is about behaviours and one of the problems about people going into the mountains um, without a great deal of experience is they can run into trouble. This individual ran into trouble actually on an Everest um, summit day. Uh, he left thinking that he'd only got a pair of gauntlets. In fact, uh, and that he left his mitts in his tent. In fact, his uh, mitts were in, in the um, top of his rucksack, but he didn't think to look there. He came down, uh, ran into big trouble. He came in fact back to the UK and this was us um, operating, taking off the digits. Clearly it was affecting both hands. He would be absolutely limited in what he could do because we would probably need to take the hand at this point here. But by burying the hand inside the belly for a month, it was then possible to bring it out, having revascularized this necrotic bone here. And in fact, he went on to climb the Matterhorn uh, uh, 12 months later much against our advice, but that's a different matter. Um, so what further resources could you use if you run into trouble? Well, we've talked about the BMC um, Frostbite Advice Service. You can look that up on the internet now. You'll, you'll get hold of our uh, details and we'd be happy to help. I trust no one with a lockdown is suffering from frostbite at the moment. And then there are a couple of open access papers you might find helpful that you, you just type the names in, um, either the Wilderness Medical Society um, practice guidelines on frostbite, or there's this one on the um, pro practical um, approach to hospital management, both of which are um, freely downloadable. Um, I'm going to stop at that point and hand back to um, David. Um, and thank you very much indeed for giving me the opportunity of talking to you. Chris, thanks ever so much. Um, I love that picture of you relying on alcohol to vasodilate after uh, after an ascent I think of Everest but um, I'm sure although alcohol doesn't actually help it makes you feel better about your frostbite. Um, Nigel I hope we've had some questions come in. Uh, we have two from YouTube David. Um, right. Shall I kick off? Yes if you could and I'll try and steer them towards the right people. Uh, a question from Ross. Um, are you there Ross? Uh, yep. Hi, uh, it's actually my question, which was that you, um, one of the speakers talked about stitching the frostbite wound into the abdomen um, to help them heal. And I've heard of them doing that with um, sort of pieces of skull when they do sort of um, craniotomy and decompressing brain injuries. But I've never heard of it being done with just like a, an amputation wound. And I was wondering why, they, why they've done that. Um, this is certainly one for Chris. I think it was a technique used in the First World War initially, wasn't it, Chris? Yes, um, it's not previously been described in frostbite. What you're doing is using the blood supply from the abdominal wall to revascularize the uh, dead bone. What it allowed us to do was to preserve the length of the digits. So if we hadn't done that, we'd have had to take off the dead bone and that would then have uh, resulted in a dysfunctional hand. Um, so it was an interesting idea. Matt Venus is the plastic surgeon I work with. He said, what about it? And um, the guy was in a very tight position um, and we thought it was worth doing. We in fact chose not to do his other hand. He was right hand dominant and uh, he didn't speak any English. So he communicated using an iPhone and we, he wanted one hand for the month to communicate with. Uh, so we chose to put his dominant hand into the, his tummy and was he was able to uh, use his left hand for communicating. It's an interesting thing. It's not often done, obviously, but uh, it just shows you, I think, and what I, what I wanted to illustrate was why, if you've got a complicated problem, it's well worth seeking the advice of a multidisciplinary team where they've got a full range of um, skills in their armamentarian. Uh, we're, certainly, we're not the only unit that we could do things like that, but it does help if you have a team that think uh, along those lines, not infrequently. Thank you for the question. And I think it's fair to say with any medical problem related to the mountains, it's really useful to have an active mountaineer in the, uh, in the team treating you. And a lot of our work is translating mountaineers' needs uh, to help non-mountaineering doctors look after them. Um, but I've been asked to go back because I believe Nigel's got some more questions coming in. Yeah, got a few more questions from YouTube. 
Um, we have a question from Dawn, um, and it's for Chris. Is there any evidence for Raynaud's syndrome being linked to a worsening frostbite? That's a great question, uh, and I'm not sure I can answer it. What I do know is that people with bad Raynaud's tend to be very cautious about what they do. They've learned uh, what they can and can't do. There's some evidence that taking certain drugs like nifedipine will mitigate this. Um, and certainly when we did Denali, a couple of the team had quite bad Raynaud's and decided, despite the, the nifedipine, they weren't happy to continue on the last day. Um, so I think there is weak evidence that Raynaud's um, would increase the risk, but it's not no stronger than that. Raynaud's is a vasospastic. It's a shutting down from a spasm rather than a blocking off from sludging of the vessel. So they're, they're slightly different mechanisms. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. Nigel, any more questions yeah. flooding uh, in? I'm a ski mountaineer and quite often I've got numb uh, fingers and toes. You now, Chris was saying about thrombotic uh, conditions in extremities uh, and treating them like any other thrombotic disease. I, mean, I wonder if, uh, if I experience the numbness, uh, taking some aspirin might, uh, might actually help in some way. I think at our age, aspirin is a good idea as long as there's no contraindication. So if you've got a history of um, stomach ulcer or anything like that, that would be a bad idea. Um, but uh, certainly I do use it at extreme altitude, thins the blood slightly. Would it reduce the risk of um, frostbite? I think that's much more behavioural. My, my concern was more a heart attack or a stroke. I'm going to play. Uh, sorry. My Can concern was, was the way it felt. Jeremy. Well, could I play devil's advocate and say I wouldn't touch aspirin with a barge pole at altitude? Uh, I think the potential of side effects are considerable and you're not treating the same pathophysiology. You're not treating the same disease process that you're treating at say, sea level when you, when you use aspirin. You use aspirin to stop platelets from working and from platelets binding together causing a clot. The reality is the strokes and issues that you get at altitude are not through platelets mucking around. They're due to a much more complicated picture and throwing aspirin at the problem, I don't think is gonna make any difference uh, and just expose you to side effects. And also the potential of, of that belief that you think, well, I'm taking a tablet and I'm gonna be okay, which I think is you know, really dangerous when it comes to using drugs as prophylaxis. Excellent. We've got a disagreement between two experts there, which is always a good place to uh, to wind this up, which I'm afraid we're going to have to do.